Dear friend, welcome to a new program in our Verdict of Science Creation series. And uh, our guest again, and we are not bored of you, sir, so we will keep inviting you. So don't, don't, don't mess with us. Um, Mr. John Mackay, geologist, uh, have some training, m lots of training. You may mention a few words on, in genetics. Well, I decided being involved in geology because we dig up dead things. Yeah. We were just well-paid undertakers, right? <laughs> so I wanted to study living things, so I went and did three years of genetics as well. Very good, because the subject today uh, will have to do with uh, living things, not just undertaking, so mm -hmm. just a switch in your job. Uh, International Director for Creation Research. Another question um, sent several times to many of us creationists, and I, I guess it's not the first time you will be getting that, uh, this question is, <coughs> okay, um, if I travel to Alaska, mm -hmm. okay, or to Canada. Are you promising not to come back? Uh, <laughs> I promise never to go there. <laughs> Won't help my joints, the cold. Um, you see, dark-skinned people out in the very cold. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just hilarious to be told, and I was taught, that skin color changed because of temperature and because you know people went to Africa and they got black. Now we see on the polar circle fairly dark-skinned people and uh, uh, but in the meantime, I see lots of people coming from Africa into Europe. I don't know how many generation they're still living here. Weather hasn't uh, made any difference on their skin color. But that is not my question. My question would be, why in the world, first of all, do we have so many uh, colors of skin? Okay, We know uh, uh, we are coming from Adam, but uh, a big drama has happened. We have Noah. and. Uh, his family and uh, we have uh, all the range from Asia to United States through Africa and up to Europe there isn't any shade of color not represented by someone's skin so mm -hmm. where's that from okay well you don't mind if I use my own arm as evidence do you uh, well if you don't have anything better just <laughs> <you'll t> <laughs> Well, we're talking about the origin of human races, which is what they're normally mm -hmm. called, right? Mm -hmm. And on my arm, I have dark spots, yes. I have tan spots, I have white spots, uh -huh. I have pink spots, right? Never seen I have the United Nations <laughs> on my arm, right? Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. the reality is, if you can do it on one body and we can find out what's happening, then it shouldn't be too difficult mm -hmm. to figure out where the different colours came from. Mm -hmm. Now, the point you mentioned at the start about you going to Alaska yeah. and seeing dark-skinned people mm -hmm. is something that's been known ever since Captain Cook, you mm -hmm. know, the English explorer, yeah. sailed up there in the 1700s, and he observed darker-skinned Inuit, or Eskimos mm -hmm. as they're commonly called, with slanted eyes, looking a lot like Asiatic, yeah. but yeah. having you know, yellowish-brown skin. And you see that color continue all the way down the west coast of America. Mm -hmm. As you go through the Americas, you see the skin becoming reddish-brown. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's true, you go to Africa, most of the native tribes in the middle to the south are dark-skinned. Mm -hmm. And as you travel through um, Europe, they're light-skinned. As you go up towards China, you see them become yellower and yellower, right, until you get the Asiatic eyelids and the, the tight black hair, etc. And so it is a very common question, if God made only one person, where do all the different skin colors come from? Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to get you to do, there's one university lecture recorded in that Bible. I can see you've got closed there. Mm -hmm. 
Now, this is not a lecture given to believers. Mm -hmm. This is a lecture given to pagans. Okay. It's the Apostle Paul, you know, well qualified. He trained under the ancient historian Gamaliel. Mm -hmm. He was a rabbi's rabbi, right? So he knew his Jewish law. He obviously spoke many languages because he's talking to the Greek academics on Mars Hill mm -hmm. in Acts chapter 17. Mm -hmm. Now, I pointed out one verse to you before. Would you read that verse, please? Yeah, it's uh, Acts 17, 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before the point and, and the bounds of their habitation. So Paul's talking to them about the God who has made all nations from one blood. blood. Now, of course, most people who read English miss the pun. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a there's a word play there that most people miss, because when you go back to Genesis, the one man being referred to is Adam, Adam. But Adam's name, you know, we spell it A-D-A-M. But the D-M sound is actually look up your Hebrew concordance. It's the Hebrew words for blood. Mm -hmm. So you have one man. He didn't have two bloods. Mm -hmm. You have one man. He is one blood. Right. And when you look, there's a clue. So your Bible says, look, even you Greeks, you're made from the same person we are. And if you want to know Paul's motivation, if anybody knew his audience, he would have been a great salesman. If he hadn't have been converted, he would have sold them anything, right? And being a Jew, he would have made a double profit. So <laughs> Just the reality case. is the Apostle Paul knew who he was talking to. Academics who were proud of their own theories of history. Now, we're back in the days when ancient Greece had dominated the world and then a little bit further on by Paul's day, they still dominated academia and they still do, right? So Greek ideas were prevalent then. Now, what's interesting is in Paul's day, the Greeks believed they'd evolved and they were very racist about it. Somewhat like Hitler, you know, Aryans have evolved. We've evolved to be the best. Mm. And he sought out to get rid of everybody else. Mm. Well, they had a very similar concept. We've evolved. We've evolved better than the Jews. Greeks are at the top of the pile. So that was their attitude. So his, his logic is, I have to first of all convince these people they didn't evolve. They are descended from one man, Adam. Mm. And that was sort of like taking a fist and punching them below the belt. Right, because that would have shot their favorite theories right down. Okay, now let's let's take all the data we've got. What color are you? Your skin color? Is it black? No. Nope. Is it brown? No. Nope. You haven't even got decent freckles like I have, have oh, I? Right. Lord. So the reality is, you would be at the white end of the spectrum. Yeah. Now, if I was to take a native from the Solomon Islands, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of northeast of Australia. Mm -hmm. They are the blackest people I have ever met. If they don't smile at night, you can't even see them, <laughs> right? They are that black. Mm -hmm. So the reality is if I take you and I line you up beside the blackest person, there's actually 34 shades of color between you and him. Wow. There's not just black and white and brown yeah. people. Yeah. There's white and off-white, and then there's not so white, and then there's creamy brown, then there's light brown, then there's President Obama brown, uh, and then there's all the way through to jet black at the other end. And then you can go across here, and there's some yellowish trends. Then there's some red trends. And there's how many? 30? 36 total 36. skin colors, wow. right? And they are shades from one to the other. And here's what we've discovered. The old story about, you know, people moving north and turning white or people going to Africa and turning <laughs> black. Well, it's always been nonsense, particularly if you start at the African end. Now, of course, the theory of evolution is the reason for, for people thinking that. And Charles Darwin's celebration of Charles Darwin's origin of species has brought this to light again. Because Darwin does not teach we were made in the image of God. He does not teach we come from one man who had one blood. We crawled out of the trees in Africa and we were some sort of ape-like creature. Question, Mr. Romulus Campan, trained theologian. What color are the creatures that crawl out of the trees in Africa? You know, the hairy ones with big arms? What color are the gorillas and the apes? Are they white? Are well, they hairy? Yeah, I know, but what color never are they? Shave they never shaved. They never had a shave, but <laughs> what color are they? Answer the question. They're not white. No, they're not. No, no, no. And well, the, their faces seem to be... they're not usually brown. What color are they? 
I don't know. You don't, you've never seen a monkey from Africa or a gorilla? Well, I did, but they're you just furry. Like they're furry, yeah. that's true, but they're black. Right? The interesting oh, really? thing is they're black and hairy. Uh -huh. Now, you have yeah, a I've seen the faces. They're pretty Good, dark, you've black, seen yeah. the faces. They're yeah. black. Good, we bring back a childhood <sighs> memory there. Now, you went to the zoo and you thought you were looking at the brother. I know. But the reality is they're black and they're hairy. Now, of all the human races on the planet, yeah. which race has the least skin hair? The black ones or the white ones? The black ones. Yeah. So the old concept of black people coming from ape-like creatures has always been nonsense. Oh, yeah. It's people like you who are the hairiest, right? The black-skinned people have the least hair. The white-skinned people have the most hair. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, you start in Africa, you have dark skin. Mm -hmm. It certainly works well there. Mm -hmm. And it was probably true to say, up until you know Captain Cook went around the world, Black-skinned people lived in hot places, cool skin, you know, white-skinned people lived in cool places, and brown-skinned people in between. But then we explored the rest mm. of the world and we discovered it was anything but the truth. Eskimos are medium brown. The people who live from Alaska all the way down to the tip of South America are rosy brown. The people that lived in the coldest part of Australia, Tasmania, mm -hmm. they were the darkest skin natives. Mm. So it's been known for ages that the story that your colour of skin matches the climate is just ridiculous nonsense. And the only reason it's accepted is because people want Darwin to be true. You know, like those ancient Greek philosophers Paul was talking to? Yeah. They wanted evolution to be true. Darwin's not new. They had their own version of Darwin back in those days. Oh, really? And they knew that if evolution was true, they were not accountable to a personal God. So that's what this is tied to. Mm -hmm. Okay, to go one step further, we mentioned Adam's name had the word for blood in it. What color is blood? Red. Red. Okay, red is not black. Red is not white. So Adam was most likely rosy brown. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is if you take your Bible seriously, Adam gave rise to Noah ultimately. Mm -hmm. Noah's three sons gave rise to everybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. And you just have to look at the planet today and say, what's the most common color? And the answer is not black and it's not white mm -hmm. because black people are less than 25% of the planet. White people are less than 25% mm. of the planet, and rosy brown are the rest, right? And you will find that the majority of people today are still some shade of brown. Mm -hmm. So your first man has to be in that category. Mm -hmm. And you can now start at the other end because in these last two years, we've had several sets of twins come from mixed family marriages. Mum and dad were middle brown. The twins that were born, one was jet black, the other was white. Now, it didn't take a million years. The baby that was born black was not born black because it was hot in the labor ward, right? It was simply, well, to simply what it was is one hormone switches this way, one hormone switches that way. When the hormone is high, the black pigment rises to the surface. When the hormone switch is low, the black pigment sinks. And here's the result. If your black pigment is at the surface, you look dark. Mm -hmm. But if you count the number of pigment cells in a black man and a white man, they're exactly the same. So the end result is, where did your skin pigment end up? At the top, you're black. In the middle, you're brown. Right down the bottom, you're white. Now on top of that, when you look at your hands or your feet, have you noticed that where your skin gets thick, it's yellow? Yep. You know, like you get, we call them corns in Australia, yep, don't yep, we? Yep. The little sort of, thicknesses of skin and it always goes yellow and the reality is there's another pigment in your skin and it's the pigment carotene mm -hmm. so guess what ca vegetable you eat to get it carrots carrots it stores in your skin oh, really? yellow pigment stores in your skin i mean many animals do this you've heard of flamingos yeah what color are they uh, pinkish pink but that's only because of what they eat yeah Right, if you don't feed them shrimp, they're not pink. You know what they do? I was told they do in Europe, they feed them paprika. Because <laughs> they love That's the shrimp. same thing. That's the same thing. They store those <laughs> colors in their feathers. So whatever you feed them is the color mm -hmm. they end up. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, we used to grow silkworms. Mm -hmm. And if you fed them green mulberry leaves, they yes. produced yellow silk. But if you fed them red cabbages, they produced purple silk. 
Oh, they eat red cabbages? Well, they will if they don't get anything <laughs> else, right? Oh, really? So you can actually change the color really of the silk by what they eat. And, uh -huh. and the same is true for human beings. We store carotene in mm -hmm. our skin. And so you will find that, again, depending on the hormones and how thick your skin mm -hmm. is, how much of that yellow shows up. Mm -hmm. So if you give all of those features together, the color of your blood, which is red, the pigment, which rises to the surface or sinks, and the carotene, then you end up with 36 combinations, none of which had anything to do with the environment, none of which was affected by the climate, mm -hmm. but it does determine the climate you can be comfortable in. Mm -hmm. You know what the moral of the story is? Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul, read what he said again in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, because he makes a point out of this, and it's a really important one. The same verse? Yes. And hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. Now that's a pretty dramatic verse, because mm. you think carefully, which God is he talking about? The answer is the God who created yeah. the first mm -hmm. man. Now, any God who can take dirt, which isn't alive, shape it into a body of a man and then breathe into it, and then the man gets up and says, G'day, right? Mm -hmm. um, any God who can do that, do you think he would really have trouble shifting people around the planet? I mean, they thought they were going of their own free will. Yeah. But in reality, he is organizing things. Mm -hmm. But did you notice why he was organizing where they went? Mm -hmm. I mean, Romulus Campan went to Hungary. The Bible says God has determined beforehand the times and places you are appointed to so that you would seek the? Well, the last bit says you would seek the Lord. What did you do in Hungary when you went there? Uh, seeking for the truth. That's right. So in reality, what you'll find is even though we sometimes get afraid of people moving into countries, we say they're trying to take us over. And of course, many of them will be mm. non-Christians. But in reality, it's the old situation. If I can't send a missionary to Iraq, mm. God is not upset by that at all. He can arrange for the Iraqis to come to where to the come Christians to. are. So Romulus Campan, who's now a Christian, can go and say, hey, do you know why you're here? Oh, yes, to take over the place. And Romulus Campan says, no, you're here to meet Jesus, to take over you. Mm. And that's, that's the, the joy of knowing that we didn't evolve. We didn't go black or brown because of the heat. We are descended from Noah via his three sons who were just like that, you know, that lady who had two different colored children, right? All you need is now a Tower of Babel to separate those and you've got the different colored races all over again. But back through Noah to Adam and our problem is sin. Not the different color on the outside, yeah. the same color problem mm -hmm. on the inside. Mm -hmm. So we need the same savior. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, you just mentioned uh, uh, all sorts of different skin colors uh, all over the world, 36 shades. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me, in Australia, for how long uh, white people, okay, who were sort of not imported, but they were exported there from Britain, isn't it true? Yes. Okay, for, uh, how, when did that happen? Basically, you're looking at the end of the 1700s, start of the 1800s. Okay. Did any one of them, descendants of the families there, because, because you are one of them, mm -hmm. okay, um, turned even one shade more dark in, let's say, three, four hundred years? What you'll find is that nobody has got darker by living in Australia. All they've got is skin cancer. So not even half of the shade? Not of even between. half of the shade in between. I mean, when summer comes, we'll all go outside and we'll get our vitamin D from the sunshine and we'll go tanned. Yeah. But we could have gone tanned back in Scotland if we had a tanning room. You yeah, know. but a, a, a tanned mother and father won't get a tanned no, baby. <laughs> no, the reality is that's just your ability built in. But when winter comes, you lose the tan, you go yeah. back to being the color you were. Mm -hmm. Whereas the aboriginals, the native people who were black before they got to Australia, mm -hmm. they don't go white in the wintertime. They don't <laughs> fade, right? They stay yeah. dark. Yeah. And so, no, it hasn't affected our skin color at all. Mm -hmm. We haven't evolved. We've only got increased problems due to skin cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is just one interesting uh, point. So Australia is not the place one would say 
uh, well, just um, an average, average normal place uh, on this planet. Just jump over the border and you'll see sort of the same thing. If anyone gets to Australia, uh, well, you find instead of grasshoppers, you see big, hairy <laughs> kangaroos. Rabbit, kangaroo rabbit hoppers. Um, you go to Tasmania, you find uh, my friend the Tessie Devil, not the Devil, but the Tessie, um, and so on. Uh, why is Australia different? Why would you find um, isolated sort of uh, species? Well, basically, genuses. Yes, you will find that what what is one of the dominant parts of our animal kingdom are called marsupials. Remember, yeah. in the program we did on the Tassie Devil, we asked you what was a baby Tasmanian Devil called? Let me think. Uh, what was it? Uh, wasn't know. Freddy. No. Was Joey, right? A Joey, Joey. A Joey, yes. They're Joey. all called Joeys, right? Joey's. Whether you're a koala baby or a oh, kangaroo yeah. baby, right? And that's what intrigues people. How come there's these animals in Australia yeah. and they're nowhere yeah. else? Yeah. Well, I love to pick on the platypus. You know what I mean by the platypus? Yeah, that strange animal that was put together. Yeah, from that's right, from all the different <laughs> other creatures. Well, that's what the first European scientists thought. Had a bill like a duck and a body like an otter and a tail like a beaver and claws like a chicken, laid eggs like a turtle, fed its young milk like a cow. And they <laughs> said, oh, this can't possibly be true. And uh, what we've discovered since is we've got living platypus in Australia, and they're about that big, yeah. not very big. Yeah. We've got fossil platypus in Australia, and they're about that big. Uh -huh. And if you go to South America, we've got fossil platypus over there too. You've got fossil platypus? Yes, in but South no America. living ones. Oh. Right, so in reality, what seems to be happening is that Australia's animals are the survivors. Uh -huh. And in other places, they've died out. We've now uh -huh. got fossil marsupial kangaroo-like creatures <coughs> in Asia. Okay. But they're only living in Australia. Uh -huh. And my suspicion is that when the animals, as well as the people, dispersed after Noah's flood, there were limited numbers of each. Of people, mm -hmm. there was only four families. Mm -hmm. Of the animals, there was two of each of the clean kind mm -hmm. and seven uh, of the unclean kind and seven of each of the clean kind, right? So you find that there were limited numbers. Mm -hmm. Limited numbers can't go everywhere. So therefore, the animals that ended up in Australia also ended up in other places. But in other places, the creatures that would become killers, uh -huh. the lions and the tigers, mm -hmm. at the end of the flood, they weren't killers. Mm -hmm. But by the days of Job, they'd become killers. Mm -hmm. But they never made it to Australia. So whatever happened uh -huh. to isolate Australia, and it's probably the sinking of the land between and the rising of the mm -hmm. water level, cut Australia off and so those creatures were protected. Mm -hmm. There's something interesting I find when I travel around the world I like to dig up dead things, you know, as the geological aspect of it. And when I'm in the north of Scotland... Why don't you take a reverend with you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could, you could, uh, and you could help me there. But you find plants that currently grow around Sydney, Australia, okay. are in the rocks in the north of Scotland. So in Australia they're still living. But okay. obviously they're dead in Scotland. Uh -huh. When I go through Canada, you find fossil possums alongside the dinosaurs. But, but they're not living there anymore. anymore. Uh -huh. So what you find is there's evidence that these marsupials were widespread, mm -hmm. but they have been more and more restricted. Mm -hmm. And like the Tasmanian devil is now only found on one island, and if we're not careful, he'll disappear off that, and our children will say, Daddy, there never was an animal that went ran, 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 and they will think you're making it up. Mm -hmm. Whereas in reality, it used to live all through the mainland, and we may find the evidence it used to live elsewhere. So Australia's animals are not as unique as most people think. Mm -hmm. But um, what you find is many of them are in other places, but they're dead in mm -hmm. the rocks. Mm -hmm. One thing uh, I was asked by some people, and I guess you were too as well, um, and you mentioned it yourself, marsupials. It seems to that that to me that uh, well, besides not having the many predators to hunt them down, okay, it's and having marsupials in f fossil deposits all over the world. What is what is that sort of um, uh, life cycle? The marsupial. Uh, sort of like life cycle uh, be sort of a benefit to uh, the 
life in Australia, like in the wild for animals? Is that well, you will find that each different kind of creature basically has a different type of reproductive mm -hmm. system, right? Mm -hmm. So that if you were to just say, okay, I'm going to divide the world up into reproductive types, you'd end up with mammals, mm -hmm. you know, babies that are born alive mm -hmm. but are suckled on milk outside their mother's womb. Mm -hmm. But then you end up with marsupials in which the baby is born alive but in, instead of being this big, it's this big. And the little baby kangaroo comes out of its mother and even though it's absolutely blind, it's instinctively built into it, it climbs up the pouch, crawls in and attaches to mother's nipple. Now given its size, it could spend months wandering around the front of a kangaroo <laughs> oh, just looking for it. <laughs> right? And so it never could have evolved. That's got to be a system. <laughs> Poor little fellow. That for works. A couple of thousand million years of yeah, walking it's around. It's got to work right from the start. Yeah. And so then the marsupial babies are brought up in that pouch. Okay. And of course, that's what makes kangaroos cute because you see mother kangaroo, you know, hopping around, nibbling on the grass, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> out of the front pops this little baby, right? And of course, then you have the cute marsupials uh, like the wombat. Okay. Now, the wombat digs burrows under the ground. And as a result, its pouch actually faces the other way. Which, if you think about it, if you're going to keep throwing <laughs> dirt through your leg to dig poor. a burrow, your poor little baby's going to be a pile of mud. Oh. So these are all well thought out yeah. systems. And uh, so oh. you'll find then it's got a backwards facing pouch and uh, the little baby f sits in that quite safe. Mother's never going to fill it up with dirt or anything. So th that is a rather unique system, mm -hmm. but it works just as well. If I ship koalas to California where the gum trees grow, it will work just as well there as it works anywhere else. Just like I can ship people to Australia and their reproductive system works. The cow's reproductive mm -hmm. system works. So you're looking at something which is designed to work from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But if I took a pig and I threw it underwater and kept it under there. I don't care how efficient its reproductive system is, it's not going to work under that situation. So mm -hmm. God thought these things well out in the beginning. So there are brilliant evidence of how cleverly he has designed the world. And that's the point we made with the point of skin color. Mm -hmm. God who has made the world has made all nations from one flesh. God who has made the world has created creatures as separate kinds to function to his honor and glory. God has sent people around the world, not so that they can just conquer the planet, right? It never belongs to us anyway, but they might know the Lord and happily dwell in him. I remember, and this is just to wrap up and finish, um, I work as a high school teacher mm -hmm. and I see so many of my colleagues and I, I'm aware many of those watching these programs are working in education because these are meant to be uh, educational programs um, on top of many other things um, we're grateful for. And you struggle with uh, being a part of a system which doesn't seem to be designed to educate children to do and to think in a proper th way. And let me give you an illustration. This is a silly joke. One um, drama uh, society in Hungary, uh, they're very hilarious. Um, they do uh, small sketches, uh, drama sketches. And one of them was about a teacher who for ages tried to teach crows to fly underwater. And he had long, long stories to tell about those <coughs> unbelievable, painful moments when he had to witness everyone and each of them dying amongst tragedies and pain and how he t had to take another crow, push him underwater, try to teach him how to fly. That one died, put him out of the water, took another crow and he did that for ages and he could tell long stories of the same thing, teaching crows, trying to teach crows to fly underwater, which if they were designed to fly in the air, they will never fly underwater. My challenge for you, my colleagues, teachers all over the world, would you just consider the system that is trying to force you to teach children act, behave, and think outside of the environment of his word and his rules and his commandments God have ordered people to live within that they might be safe 
and live and act the way they should act as creatures being cre created in his own image. We, as teachers, we have a great responsibility to teach children to act in the atmosphere which God designed for children to be raised in the fear of God, which they would never forget, even being adults. We should stop uh, forcing children to think, to think what they're not supposed to think, to think only what they're told instead of us, as Mr. Mackay said it so many times, instead of teaching them how to think, we sort of become part of a system which pushes down their minds things they do not understand, try to act and behave based on that, and you'll find the disastrous results, like in the Columbine school. Well, in a school system that doesn't have any rules and boundaries and morals and ethics, this is what you would, you would expect to do. So let us take those who are given to us by God as responsible teachers and learn them to walk and to have the wings of their soul to fly under the sky of God and not push them in the muddy deep waters of evolutionism. Um, I, I guess that, that would be a good point to have any hopes. Oops. It would, and they can go to our website mm. for lots of free help mm. there. Mm. So that's creationresearch.net, mm. mm. and uh, click on the free DVDs or Great. click on all sorts of things to help mum and dad, mm. to help the teachers. And the point is, since we're made in God's image, mm. even though sinners deface that, we'll only really mm. uh, rejoice in yes. being what we mm. are if we're remade mm. in that image, yeah. whether we're a mother or a dad or a student, mm. a teacher, mm. whatever, it doesn't matter. So creationresearch.net for lots of free help on that issue. We over time. Mr. Mackay, thank you so much. Uh, don't run away. We still have some programs to uh, get out to our friends. Thank you so much. May God bless you. See you in the next program.